If it's low, just let me know. I'll see if I can fix it. Okay, so uh, I wanted to kind of start this this part of it by uh, t talking about how to make a GIF. Do people say GIF or GIF? Uh, GIF? GIF. Yeah. <laughs> GIF. Anyway, we're going to make these things. Um, so this is still kind of part of the introductory uh, part of the diagrams talk. I guess, uh, you know, Somebody asked me, you know, kind of what the use case for diagrams is, and kind of I'm showing a lot of kind of toy applications, things that are just for fun, but really for kind of technical illustration or kind of any, uh, you know, any type of illustration you want to do, illustrating an algorithm or things like that. It's uh, it's quite powerful when used in combination with Haskell itself. That uh, I think is quite fun to do. Is you solve some problem, and then you can just kind of illustrate immediately um, with Haskell. So for example, in our gallery we have uh, the, the, um, the famous knight's tour problem. You have a chessboard and you have a knight on it and the knight has to touch every, uh, every square on the chessboard. You can actually write the algorithm right there in Haskell and then illustrate it right there using diagrams without you know, changing, uh, changing languages or anything. So creating a, a GIF in, in diagrams is really easy. Uh, unfortunately, only two of the back ends support it right now, the uh, Rasterific back end and the, the Cairo back end. Um, you know, GIFs are kind of really fun. The uh, this kind of, I like to tell a little bit of a story when I, when I think about this part of the diagrams development because I think it really speaks well to the community. The, I, I wanted to make, uh, you know, an animated uh, GIFs and diagrams because I just, you know, I think think they're really fun and I was looking at this this website called beesandbombs.tumblr.com. I don't know if anybody's seen that. Um, but if you haven't you should check it out. And you know as, as much as it's it's not in diagrams, it's in processing.js, they do make some of the really some of the best animated GIFs you can see. And uh, really fun. So I wanted to do that and we had already used juicy pixels a little bit in our, our diagrams code to incorporate images in and I looked at the juicy pixels library and I saw that it had the ability to read uh, GIFs, but not the ability to write them. So I sent uh, you know, a quick email to the, to the author, uh, Vincent, of that, and I said, you know, why can't you write GIFs? And he said, well, we need a color quantization module, and we need this. I want to include it. I just don't have time. Um, would you work on it with me? So I said, sure. And uh, he sent me a few papers he was reading that you know, talked about the algorithms. And a few weeks later, we had animated GIF output in Juicy Pixels. And it was just, uh, I just, to me, that's just what the Haskell community is really all about, getting together with you know, people in their libraries and kind of working on code together. And it was a good experience for me. But this one, uh, I don't know uh, if you remember a year or two ago, there was this kind of craze on the internet a little bit about how if you put these two white bars in front of your 3D animation, you could make something seem almost really much much more three-dimensional. And they had all these ones with kind of lizards coming out at you and, and things like that. So I took that idea here and, I, and, uh, and I, I did a simple implementation where the pendulum is in front of the two bars when it's closer to you and it's behind the two bars if you look carefully in the back. And hopefully that gives an illusion um, that the thing is actually you know, a little bit more three-dimensional than it would be um, otherwise. So easy, start with the background. The, uh, it, it turns out that the background color of uh, the GIF format is naturally black. So all we really have to do to make this is make those white stripes. And to make those white stripes, um, I just create the stripe function. It's, uh, it's a square, and I scale the square in the, in the x direction to be uh, a much smaller a much smaller percentage. We have a rectangle function in diagrams, but it's fairly common idiom to take squares and circles and make them into rectangles and ellipses. And uh, that's exactly what I did here. The strut x uh, function just leaves space. So um, this function creates this, this kind of stripes uh, for the background, which is, which is really the easy part. Um, the, the ball at the end of the pendulum is actually called a bob, you know, um, not a Robert, but a, a bob. And <laughs> Uh, by making it kind of giving this uh, giving it this kind of gradient, you can kind of get a pretty good 3D feel for it. Actually, make it seem like a sphere, um, and that uh, kind of brings up the uh, the fact that we have the ability to do gradients in in diagrams. 
almost all the back end support gradients, but to kind of a different degree. Surprisingly enough, uh, all the different browsers, you know, in their rendering of SVG, don't all get gradients right. Even Firefox gets it wrong. Chrome gets it right. Um, and believe it or not, Internet Explorer gets it right. There's some, just some small things with radial gradients that the other ones don't get correct. Um, and, and Cairo has a, I think Cairo has a bug at the C++ level, so they don't get, get gradients right either. But uh, the Rust terrific back end and uh, Chrome the SVG gets, gets it exactly uh, right according to the SVG spec at least. Um, so it's like any other gradient, we need to create, we need to create stops and we need to create colors. And uh, in this case, you know, radial gradients are defined um, two ways. It kind of has like an inner circle, which has a, a center and a radius, and an outer circle, which has a center and a radius. And the, the color goes from the outside of the inner circle to the outer circle. And that's how uh, we generate this. Here I have the bob kind of also sitting on a, uh, a linear gradient back end that's it's not implemented here, but that kind of actually brings out the, the three-dimensional feel to it. Uh, I, just, I just included that to, to highlight the fact that, of course, we have linear gradients as well. OK, so a, a pendulum is a bob and a, and, and a rod. And it, if you, I didn't um, do any physics, but if you look at it, it kind of looks like it's going around an ellipse. So I made an elliptical path. And I use that idiom again of instead of using our ellipse function, I just uh, scale the circle in the x direction, and that, that turns out to be an ellipse. Um, and the, uh, the bob I get by kind of um, by sizing a circle. And this, the size is going to change with each frame of the animated GIF. So because as the, as the bob is further from you, or at least in, uh, looks further from you, it's going to be smaller. And as, as it's closer to you, it's going to look like it's getting bigger. And we set the texture with, uh, with fill texture. And radial is what we defined on, on the previous slide. We defined that kind of black and white 3D um, texture. We, uh, before we've been setting things with color, we've been using the fill color command. Fill color is actually an alias for fill texture with plus the function solid. The function solid takes a color and makes it into a texture type. And radial is a texture type. So, that's, um, so it's a little bit more general than that. The, uh, as you can see, I calculate the size based on the y coordinate. And sometimes it's the easiest way uh, to connect things in, in diagrams is to actually use our, our arrow API. So here I connect the, uh, the rod with the bob using the arrow between function. And I just create an arrow that doesn't have a head or a tail. Um, and again, you're going you're gonna to see our, uh, you know, our record API where we use the, the idiom of the, the width plus the lens operators to set the, the features of the arrow. Here I'm setting the arrow shaft to have a thick line width and be gray. And I'm setting it to not have a head, and it points between the, uh, the two points, which I calculated below. Um, I want to calculate the point on the ellipse where that bob is centered at. And the way I do that is with, um, by using the trace. So once I have that ellipse, and I have its, its origin in the center, and I calculate the trace, it tells me exactly where on, on the ellipse I need to be. And so that's what that E function is. The, um, I had mentioned earlier that um, not, every, um, not every object has a trace. So when we ask for a trace of an object, we get a maybe back. And so in this case, if uh, I, know, I know my ellipse is going to have a trace, but I have to handle that anyway. And if I, uh, if I get nothing back, I'm just going to set it to the origin, which should never happen. Um, Lastly, um, kind of on R2 is kind of takes, well, you know, takes a, a vector in two-dimensional space and gives, me, and gives me back the coordinate pair. And we could have also gotten at that using uh, an ISO, you know, our, our lens ISO. Okay. So we put it all together and um, we, make, we make a GIF by making one frame at a time. And then what we do is we create a list of pairs and the pairs are the frames and how long each frame in, um, I believe it's hundreds of a second, um, stays on the screen. So here I, um, I kind of use the, the previous function to make the frames and I rotate them around that ellipse. And in this case, each frame is going to last for three hundredths of a second and I'm going to make a hundred of them. So then instead of, instead of sending main width uh, a diagram 
B, I send it a list of diagrams and ints, uh, those ints being, uh, being the delays, and, and that creates the GIF, and th that's all there is to it. I kind of promised that we can kind of fix our kaleidoscope. Uh, this is something kind of similar. Uh, although the logic is almost identical, this is a three mirror kaleidoscope. The really only difference is you, if, you, uh, if you go back to our hexagonal kaleidoscope and you create six copies of it or five copies of it around, uh, seven copies altogether around it, um, you'll get like what looks like a three mirror kaleidoscope. And all I'm doing is letting kind of, letting all the confetti kind of move down slowly uh, for change in each frame. And you kind of get that, I don't know, I think it's a little bit kind of mesmerizing, but you know. You, you kind of get that with like 40 lines of diagrams code. Good. All right, so if there aren't any questions, or maybe if there are questions, I'll take them, but I'm, I wanted to kind of now talk about arrows a little bit. Um, but before I do, does anybody want to ask anything? Right. So the B is a token that is exported by each backend. So basically, with our pluggable backend system, um, a, a, a backend doesn't have, doesn't have a fixed set of primitives that it has to render, or a fixed set of operations that it has to adhere to. So some backends you know, may, uh, you know, may have the ability to kind of make uh, you know, Bezier curves. Some might have uh, uh, you know, different features to create different primitives, circles, squares, I if you will. But not every backend has to. And so what the backend does is it exports a token called B, which, which as I said, is, is a little bit of a hack, so that when I import that backend and it's, its token, I know what primitives that backend can render. That way, when I compile my diagrams code, if somebody's tried to access a primitive that can't be rendered by that backend, back end, the type check will flag it for them. So that was kind of a design decision. We could have made, and, and we've thought about making that dynamic. Um, it, it's, not, it's not too hard to do to just kind of, um, you know, make that completely dynamic and not let the type checker handle it and figure out a way to kind of bow out gracefully if the back end doesn't handle a, a particular primitive. But so for example, somebody was asking me during the break how we might handle blending operations between colors and shapes. Well, if I have a particular back end that handles a blending operation, I can kind of now write a few functions that handle that. And then when I'm using that back end, because of that B token, if I use a function, a blending function in diagrams and I'm using that back end, it'll type check just fine. But if I, if I try to change out the back end on that same diagrams code and I have a function that uh, is not supported by the back end, the type checker will tell me. So that's what the B is for. It's to kind of, it kind of ties together the, the primitives rendered by the back end and, and the rest of the diagram source. Okay. So I said arrows are really tricky in, in, in diagrams and, and um, let's just talk about kind of what kind of features we would want to have in an arrow library. And then hopefully that'll kind of lead us to why they're, they're a bit tricky. So usually you don't want your arrow head. And when I say arrow head, I also mean the arrow tail here. We usually don't want that to scale with the diagram. If I'm connect, if I have an, uh, you know, a, a diagram and I'm connecting two things and I have an arrow and I want to increase the size of that diagram by 20%, I usually don't want the head and tail of that um, of that arrow to, to scale. Or if I do, I might want it to scale in a different way. I might not want it to scale with the objects inside the diagram. I might want it to scale with the, with the objects as a whole. And so we have a very flexible um, way to, allow, to specify the size of the, of the arrowhead. Um, and that, that's called measurement units. And I'm, I'm going to get that to that in a few minutes. But it's the same way we allow the setting of line widths. You know, so, um, a line width is kind of a funny thing in, 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 um, in, in 2D, if you will, because you know, lines don't have width in, in the mathematical sense, but we always, you know, in 2D vector graphics libraries, we always have the ability to stroke our lines, and it's very convenient to be able to draw the outline uh, of, a, um, 
of an object. But if I have, uh, if I want to create two circles, you know, a circle of radius one and a circle of radius two, and I want to do that by taking the circle of radius one and scaling it, double its size, I probably don't want the line width to double on that. I probably want it to stay consistent. So we have to take, you know, special precautions on how to handle the line width. Sometimes, sometimes I do want the line width to, you know, scale with the diagram. Sometimes I don't want it to scale with the diagram but I want it to scale with the size of the total diagram at the end. Um, and all these options are available in diagrams. They make things like, um, they make arrows in particular a little bit more difficult. I like to think of arrows as kind of the poster child of everything, everything that's difficult in diagrams, because if it works for arrows, it's usually gonna work for almost any, anything else you can think of, because it really embodies a lot of the, um, a lot of the compromises that we, we might have had to make. The other thing you, you definitely want is if you have an arrow and it's connecting two points and you scale your diagram, you still want it to be connecting those two points. And that's very much related to the first one, which we're going to see. We want the arrow shafts to be, uh, you know, any path or trail, not, not just straight lines. And we want the heads and the tails to have the ability to be trans, translucent or transparent. That affects the design quite significantly because it doesn't allow us to overlap the arrow head and the arrow shaft. If you have a translucent head and you overlap it with the shaft, you're gonna see the shaft. And that makes it, so it, makes it that much more difficult. So we do have uh, you know, a, very, um, a very rich arrow API. Um, this is kind of the, uh, the test diagram I use whenever we're making changes to, to arrows to make sure this works. But you can see we've got a whole bunch of different types of heads and tails. You can make the, the heads uh, different colors from the shafts. You can use anything, you know, dashing for the lines. You can connect the center of each of these spheres. You can connect the outside of each of these spheres, um, uh, spheres circles, uh, and, um, and, and a lot more things. We've got a collection of pre-made heads and tails, and we also have, the library also allows you to kind of create your own. Um, so now I'm going to kind of go through the, the kind of design points, if you will, and talk about um, how they influence and how they become a challenge. So the first one was that arrowheads should not scale with the diagram, and I really mean that a little bit more generally. It shouldn't scale necessarily, you know, the same way that the objects in the diagram scale. So in other words, as I said before, if I'm scaling a circle and I apply, a, you know, a scale of two to it, I I'm, I don't want an arrow connecting those two circles. I don't want its head to scale by two. So originally when, when I started working on diagra the diagrams library, this is kind of the f what, what was being worked on right at the time. And the thought was that if we could wrap the head in some type of a wrapper, a new type, that caused transformations not to apply scale to it, but only to apply uh, the other linear transformations, rotations and translations and um, shears, then we'd be done. Because if, if, you look at, if you look at this example here, you see the arrows on the left or what happens if the head scales just along with the rest of the arrow. And the, you know, the second one down from the top, I, I scale the X and the head, is, the head actually kind of changes shape because it goes from an equilateral triangle to kind of a smush triangle. The one below it, I've scaled, the, uh, you know, I've scaled things in the direction of Y and that kind of made the head look even weirder. And then, worstly, in the, in, the, in the final one, I first rotated the arrow and then I scaled it in the, in the X direction. And that kind of distorted the head and actually makes, makes, the, uh, makes one perceive a little bit of a rotation for the head. So that doesn't really, really work well, but if we actually make the, the scale component of, of the heads in, invariant and we do that properly, then when we apply all those scales, uh, e even the non-uniform scaling after the rotation, everything looks hunky-dory. Unfortunately, and, and as a matter of fact, we implemented you know, the, the, the Arrows library this way, and it wasn't until after it was implemented and everything was looking great and working well that we noticed this bug. We never, for some reason, we never tried to scale the arrow up. But if you scale the arrow up, you wind up with the problem that you see in the lower right. The head separates from, from the arrow shaft. Why? Why is that? Well, suppose the total length of the arrow is 2 and the length of the, the head was 0.1. If I now want to scale it up by 2, if I don't scale the head up by 2, the, uh, the old shaft was, point nine, was 
1.9. I scale that, I get 3.8. I add the head back to it, and the total length of my arrow is 3.9, not 4. I don't know if that made any sense. <laughs> I, I may have uh, gone back and forth. But in other words, if you just apply the scale to the shaft, you won't have enough scaling. It won't get big enough because I want to scale the total arrow. So I would actually have to kind of do some weird calculation to figure out how big the arrow has to be if I'm not going to scale the head at all. So we noticed that arrows were separating. So that's a problem, and that, um, that's something that has to be addressed when, um, when we figured out how to do this the right way because we, we really need arrows to be able to be scalable. Um, the third point, this really didn't, um, didn't really make the, the design of the arrows library that much more difficult. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty easy to incorporate arrow shafts that are, um, that are not straight lines. You just need to be able to know, um, you know what the tangent is to those at the end point so you can put the arrow head on in the right direction. And that's actually pretty easy. As a matter of fact, this kind of led us to... Uh, Define the arrows API in a way where you don't even really, when you're building an arrow, you don't really say how long the arrow shaft is. You just say where it's going between, and diagrams calculates exactly how long it has to be for you. So that's kind of um, a nice feature of the API. And, and here's an example where the, the heads actually have some transparency to them. And so you can, you can see um, that in this case, the arrow shaft is, is, is opaque, it's solid orange, the heads have a translucency of about uh, 0.5. And so those are all the things we, we really want um, in, in our library. And we have, um, we've seen so far, the, you know, scale invariance gets us so far, but it, it doesn't solve all our problems. Um, and so kind of here's an, an, another, you know, little bit of a problem. And, and this problem comes from the translucence. That is, if I have a pretty thick arrow shaft and I have a head with a convex back and I try to put them next to each other without overlapping, I get that little white triangle in there. That's not good, right? I need to fill that in. So we, uh, we fill that in. We call that little piece the, the joint of the arrow and we need to fill that in. Except that presents a problem again because we don't know the, the width of the line till the diagram is rendered at the end. So in other words, one way you could specify line widths in diagrams is as a percentage of the total size of the diagram at the end. But when we're building a diagram up from its components, we don't know what that total size is. As a matter of fact, the user can specify that. So we don't know the actual line width, so we don't know um, at what point it's going to intersect the head, and we don't know how to calculate that, that arrow joint. So that's actually, um, you know, adds to kind of the complexity in terms of trying to figure out how to, how to how to design these um, arrows so that all of our features are met. So it, it basically really boils down to, to two re related problems, and they're related because we need to know the final size of the diagram, and w one is how to, you know, how to scale arrows, and two is that the joint size depends on the shaft width. As a matter of fact, the joint size also depends on the head length because the, the head is, is measured in the same units um, as the shaft. So I wanted to talk about it in the kind of, you know, in the context of these measurement units. So before diagrams 1.1, everything either scaled locally or could be, or didn't scale at all. So for example, line width, you could set your line width to non-scale at all, not scale at all, you just set what the line width was, very much like a font size, you know, 12 point or something, or you could freeze it in which case er, any scaling operation applied after that would also be applied to the line width and then it would be treated just like a rectangle. What we decided to do was, was take that out and implement a more flexible way to specify things like the width of a line. So we actually have four measurement units and that's, you know, so you'll see things like, um, like line width normalized or line width local or line width output. These are different kind of units that we use when we kind of specify the, the, width, the stroke width of any diagram. So local, you know, if you use the local measurement unit, then the line scales just like anything else in diagrams. If I start with a line that's um, 0.2 wide and I scale it by 2, it's going to be 0.4 wide. And so kind of that's the semantics you, 
you don't typically want for, for line width unless you're doing something funny with it. Normalized um, is the one that we use almost all the time. That sets the width of the line to some percentage of the final size of the diagram. And that's very helpful if, if, you're, if you're creating a diagram for a textbook and then you decide you want to make a poster and kind of print it out, then your line widths will look totally fine in, in both cases. And if you really want fine-grained control over your line width, you can, um, you can set an output <coughs> units, which is something like pixels, and it, it eventually will go to you know, physical units. Um, but that doesn't change at all. And that's, um, you know, that's very much like I said, if, if you set a font to a point size of 12, that's 12 no matter, you know, no matter what, what, the, um, what scale is applied to it. And then lastly, there's a unit called global, which I'm not even going to explain because, to be honest, every time I go to explain it, I have to look it up myself. It's, it's only around for backward compatibility. Really, it has some kind of strange features. Sometimes when you disappear. Um, so we, we, don't, um, we don't need to go into that, and I, I don't even recommend using it. Hope, I'm hoping that gets deprecated in one of the... One of the next few versions. Okay. So in order to kind of solve this problem, we need to, you know, kind of understand the diagram's type a little bit. And before I kind of, you know, put the type up on, on, uh, on the slide, um, I just want to talk about what it is. So a diagram is really a tree, right? So when we start, when we start building a diagram, we usually create things like like we saw before, we take a square and we put it beside a circle. Those become the leaves of the tree. And then as we, you know, the, those might get kind of <coughs> joined with the semi-group operator and that's a kind of concatenation node. And then if I want to apply, a, let's say, a transformation to it, that becomes an internal node of the tree that contains um, that concatenated part of the tree. Um, envelopes are stored kind of alongside of each diagram. They're not in the tree, but they're cached and paired with, uh, with, with the kind of root of each tree. So, uh, you know, as I said in these, these bullets, every time two diagrams are composed, the envelope is calculated and cached, and diagrams are built from the leaves up. Attributes, like transforms, are stored as internal nodes, but you can think of them as being applied from the top down, because once I have a diagram tree, if I want to apply something like fill color to it, I, you know, I just walk down the tree, I apply fill color everywhere, and everywhere that the fill color hasn't already been set, it would be set to, um, to blue. And so that's, that kind of gets a little bit, of the, so to speak, at the crux of our problem with arrows, because I in order to transform arrows, I need to know what transformations are going to get applied to it, and those transformations can happen anytime, in particular they can happen after this whole big complex tree is built. But I need to know there in order to kind of position them, as you've seen, I need to know their envelope. And I can't calculate that unless I know the scale, the transformations that are being applied. And this is exacerbated by the, this problem that we have these, all these different measurement units. So I can throw scale into the top of the tree, but also those measurement units inside the tree, are, you can kind of think of them as holes that have to get filled in. Right? They eventually have to get filled in with absolute measurement units so that the back end knows how to render them. But those, don't have, those, aren't, those aren't chosen and can't be chosen until I know the entire, entire size of the diagram. So the trick is, you know, how can I build these, you know, how can I build my arrow when the arrow is kind of there at the leaf level when I don't know the transformations and the measurement units that I need to build it? And that's, you know, um, that's somewhat reflected in, uh, in the actual type of a diagram. This actually isn't in one, in one specific place in the code. I've kind of grabbed it from uh, you know, a, few, a few places within diagrams.core.types. It's not too far apart, but it, you know, here's, here it is kind of all together. And in order to un understand this code, you need to know a few things. You need to know what a dual tree is. Um, you need to know what that three dots operation is, which is uh, a way of combining our things for uh, heterogeneous monoidal lists. Um, you need to know what the deletable semigroup is. And I'm not going to go into all that because we don't have time, um, all, as interesting as it may be. But what I want you to, t what, what I want you to take out of this uh, 
type. And on the very next slide, I'm going to create a simplified type that encompasses all we want. <coughs> but I want you to look at the QD leaf, which is kind of the leafs. Leafs are not implemented as primitives. They're implemented as either a primitive or a delayed leaf, which is just basically a function from the three things I've been talking about that we don't know yet um, to a diagram. So I can kind of, you can think of it as putting a continuation in a leaf in, uh, in addition to a diagram or a primitive. And that continuation won't be run until the leaf is compiled or traversed from the top down. And I know the information that I need to, kind of, to calculate um, all the positional things um, and how big to make the arrow shaft and things like that. So here, here's a simplified diagram type that I think, you know, for our purposes would work, okay? It's a pair of an envelope and a diagram tree. A diagram tree can either be a, a leaf, it can be a, a transformation, and that contains, um, of course, another diagram tree because that's an internal node. Um, or it can just be a, a concat node, a way to put, put diagrams together. And the leaf is, is pretty much what it was before. It could also be this delayed function that takes the transformation and those two ends, those two ends represent numbers depending only one of them, only one of those numbers will be non, um, will be in effect and that will, will tell you how to, you know, how to scale things like line width and arrowheads um, depending on, on the final size of the diagram. So what needs to happen to render this arrow? Uh, let's just say you know, this diagram was kind of built up by taking a circle of size one and a square of size one and then applying a transformation to get it to like size 500. Um, and then the user kind of at the end kind of runs his program and he actually wants to print it out at a thousand pixels wide. What has to happen for, for that arrow to be drawn? Well, we need to know how wide the line is and that could very much, very may well be a function of the, the, those thousand pixels. We need to know how long the head is, which can, can be a function of the same thing. And we need to know how far apart those two origins are, which is a function of the transformations applied to the diagram, which if the diagram was originally a circle of uh, radius one and a square of radius two, those things are gonna start two apart, but once I transform it, they can be you know 1,000 apart or, or 500 apart. So in, ki in terms of the, um, in terms of the diagram tree, it, it looks something like this, right? I, I want to combine those, those two objects, the circle and the square with the arrow, um, and it winds up being some type like I have at the bottom. And I can't really do that. I can't really draw the arrow because I need to know those unknown things. So I've, I've kind of given it away a little bit. The solution is that we, um, we have this concept called the delayed leaf, and the delayed leaf is, you know, I like to think of it as, as I said, as a continuation that gets run after the tree is built. So we build the tree from the leaves up, including the arrow, but the arrow gets kind of put in as a function. And then when I know everything I need to know, when I know all the transformations, all of the measurement units, and I walk down the tree, then and only then can I build my arrow. And this same, these same problems not only apply to arrow, they can apply a little bit to text because it's very difficult to know um, you know, depending on how you specify text, you don't know exactly the width of text until um, if at the end the user kind of specifies text. M maybe text can be specified as a percentage of the total diagram size. Um, line, line width presents, as, a, as I've already mentioned, kind of similar problems here. If we want, if we actually want the width of the line to be able to take it into account in the envelope of the diagram, that's actually a difficult problem. So one of the suggestions that's on the table is actually kind of re, uh, redefining the semantics of a diagram as a mapping from, um, from you know, all this information about the transformations and the scale to this tree type thing and then calculating a diagram as a fixed point of, uh, of that mapping. And that's something we're uh, actively exploring and it, it'll give us even kind of It'll give us the, the power, if you will, to kind of clean up uh, some of the last few things that are still challenges in diagrams, like, uh, like, as I said, including the width of a line in the envelope of a diagram. And I think I'll stop here um, and take some questions. If um, 
I have a few more slides, but I think um, it probably would take longer than, than the time we have left. So let's just take some questions and uh, see how, how that takes us. That's a good question, actually. So we actually have the, the ability to name subparts of the diagram. So the easiest way to do that would be to name the circle and the square. And we do that with a function called named, I think. It's either name or named. Um, and you can use any, any type uh, can be the name. We usually use strings, but you could use integers. Um, you could use, use any type. I think it just has to, uh, it probably just has to uh, implement eek, maybe or if we keep it in a tree, I'm not sure. Um, and then later you refer to those names, you say something like arrow between square circle. So, you, so in order to build an arrow, you need to statically know those names? You, you, yeah, but you make the names when you make the sure. circle, and it doesn't, it doesn't cost you anything. It's, it's, it sits in the tree, and uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it, it's superfluous to you. Otherwise, you'd have to know where the points are, and you'd have to use a function like, which you can do as well. You can use the arrow at function. Um, Yeah, we usually use it with that kind of hash mark operator. We'd say hash mark named kind of uh, double quote circle, and we do it that way. And we have you know, we have a lot of convenient you know convenience functions. So if I have two shapes and I want the arrows to connect the origins, I think that's arrow be arrow between or connect. If I wanted to correct connect their perimeters at the trace, there's something called arrow perim. Uh, we have gaps. You know, you can you can specify how much gap you want between. Where the arrow is going from, and and its you know its uh, destination and its target, so to speak, um, it's a pretty rich, rich API. Yeah, I, I think I I probably implied that that wasn't okay. That's actually fine. The measurement units stay with the once they're applied. It's like any other attribute or style and diagram. So if I have this particular line that's outlining my square and I apply a line width in, uh, in normalized units, which is our, our percentage of the total diagram size, and then I have a circle and I, and I apply uh, its line width uh, as local so that it scales with the circle itself, those two things will just work. OK, so I, I won't talk about this, but I'm going to about was going to uh, do, and I encourage you to kind of uh, look in the GitHub repo and contrib. Does anybody know what an L system or a Lindemeyer system is? They're kind of these fun, uh, fun things with uh, kind of rewrite rules, and they were, they're originally used to kind of describe, uh, you know, botany and, uh, and growth things for plants. And I've been playing with these for uh, a couple of days, and what, what happens is you can just kind of, you can write down kind of a few simple rules and then run the thing and just kind of generate all kinds of, uh, you know, all kinds of cool stuff. Um, so I guess if there are no, uh, no more questions, we should probably... Uh, so, so, uh, so, so do you have anything in the, you said there was a, an HTML5 uh, backend. Do you have any examples of that uh, lying around? You said it generated JavaScript. So all, everything that you've seen here today, except for the animated GIFs, by simply changing that line, let's see. Uh, so where I have import diagrams that SVG that command line, if I change that S SVG to HTML5, yeah. and if I have that installed, you know, with Cabal, then it will generate. Then when I run this, instead of generating SVG, it will generate JavaScript. It's it's still kind of one-way JavaScript. It's static, um, I, and I think you know I'm hoping that. It's got to eventually be nice if there's some kind of merger between the uh, ML5 backend. What'll probably happen first is the Canvas backend will probably be able to write standalone JavaScript. So right now the Canvas backend can actually be interactive, I can, but it only works on a local host on your system, so it doesn't work over the web. It was written by uh, Andy Gill and the guys at the uh, at Kansas University, really for kind of teaching people. Haskell, so that they can they can kind of write graphical applications right out of the box using uh, a library called Blank Canvas. Carter. Why is there a lot of restriction there? 
Where? Why is it there? Because if you take it away sooner or later, maybe not on this diagram, you're going to get an error that you didn't know why you got. <laughs> so I, I, we can talk about it, you know, why, where that comes from. Um, No, not with diagrams. Yeah, okay. yeah. The, oppos the opposite is true, trust me. Yeah. Anyone else? Yep. Yeah. So the arrow scaling issue sort of reminds me of a situation where, uh, well, let's put it this way. Like if, you're, if you were trying to uh, define an arrow and you were defining the stroke with like a CSS rule and then scaling some sort of SVG group, that wouldn't be an issue, right? Like the, C the CSS rule. So the CSS doesn't affect the SVG, or, unless I'm mistaken. You'd say put the class inside your SVG. See, the reason it, I think it's not an issue in SVG is because at the end of the day, when your SVG is generated, you actually have all of the coordinates. So if you look at the way a path is drawn, you're going to have hard-coded numbers in there. But that's not really true for a diagrams program. A, a, a diagrams compiles into an executable that takes, amongst other things, the size of that final diagram. So that you can't, it can't even be known until that executable is run. It's flexible enough that... Um, Yeah, so... But it's all defined in whatever coordinate system is in... I, uh, never mind, I get right. what you're saying. And I'm not... I'm not I, get, a, I get what you're saying completely now. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Oh, Brian? Uh, just a uh, quick request. Could you uh, post... You, you had a paper earlier on the... Um, on, on, on the, um, the URL for the on the on paper. Yeah. Could you just post that? Yes. Point? Yes, I promise to post that, and if I don't, uh, Doug or uh, Ryan will email me. Um, it's, it's not a, uh, a reviewed paper, I just wrote it to, so that we don't forget <laughs> what we already know. But, okay, anyone else? All right, thanks for listening.